Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This weekend sees the release of the long-awaited Oppenheimer movie, a movie which I'm probably not seeing anytime soon because, hey, you know, writers and actors are on strike, but also I'm incredibly busy. But yes, uh, I did want to talk about Trinity since everybody else seems to be talking about it. So yeah, Trinity was, of course, the test of the first uh, atom bomb that was uh, you know, performed. This took place in New Mexico in a location called Jornada del Muerto, which loosely translates from Spanish as the journey of the dead man, which seems pretty appropriate considering what went on there. They didn't actually kill anyone, but, you know, they laid the groundwork. So this location had been chosen out of a handful of other possible locations around the US. They were looking for a place that was, you know, secure, it could be it was remote, it was largely uninhabited, and which was also somewhat convenient for the scientists and engineers and various people that were working on the Manhattan Project. So the site at the Trinity site was a part of the Alamogordo bombing range and this area had been acquired in 1942 by the US government. The residents had been moved off the land, you know, they'd been, their, their stuff had been bought. There was like on the Trinity site, there was one building. It was the uh, McDonald Ranch House. Yes, Old McDonald had a farm. Uh, and this was converted to a lab where they would actually do hardware assembly, including parts of the bomb. Now, interestingly, due to the secrecy of this whole project, some of the people operating on the bombing range didn't actually know there was going to be a super secret test going on. And there was a couple of times when the camp that was there was was actually bombed by pilots practicing in the range. I'm sure that got sorted out at some point because it would have been kind of embarrassing if uh, it didn't. But yeah, the site itself hosted two major tests. There was actually a rehearsal test um, months before. This was entirely conventional. They had a you know short tower and they stacked about a hundred tons of TNT on top of it. They uh, lace this with a bunch of um, you know radioactive material and then detonated it and they used all their various scientific instruments they wanted to get as much measurement as possible and they went through all the testing protocols that they would actually have for the trinity test now this showed that their instruments worked mostly it also showed that for example they didn't have enough radios they didn't have enough roads and so they spent a lot of time and money and effort upgrading the site so they could handle the big thing now, at this point, they weren't 100% sure this weapon was going to work. And one other thing that they built on the site was a, a structure called Jumbo. Now, Jumbo was a giant pill-shaped steel container. The idea was that the plutonium in the bomb was the most valuable thing there. It, they spent about a billion dollars on the plutonium for one of these tests. And if the explosives went off and the implosion didn't properly happen, then the plutonium would just be scattered across the desert. So Jumbo was supposed to contain the force of the conventional explosion and capture the plutonium. They came up with protocols for how they would recover the plutonium from a fizzle, from a bomb that didn't actually go off. Now, um, in the end, Jumbo was never actually used, but then they did build this you know, 200 ton steel container and have it on site. They actually hung it from uh, a tower near the site, just, you know, I guess, to get scientific data on how well a nuclear explosion actually affects, like thick steel. So anyway, the big reason, of course, they didn't need Jumbo was the test was successful. And the reason the test was successful was because of the work of all the various scientists and engineers working on it. And I really want to be clear, the Manhattan Project was more than just Oppenheimer. In the early days, Oppenheimer thought, you know, a handful of physicists in a couple of months was all they would need. But no, it needed standing up a whole new set of industries to solve the problems, particularly on the acquisition, the refining, um, you know, the generation of the fissile material that would be needed for the various weapons. But to make Trinity work, they needed to make a perfect implosion. And a lot of the responsibility for that falls down to a guy called George Kistakowski. So he was the person in charge of the explosives and he wasn't a physicist. 
he was uh, actually a chemist. He, he was originally from Ukraine in the pre-revolutionary Russia. You know, he uh, actually fought on the white army side for a while, but uh, he fled, moved to Germany, got a PhD in chemistry, and by the start of World War II, he was a professor at Harvard. And so he, he was recruited early on, even before World War II, the US was start standing up scientific endeavors to support potential war efforts. And they had recruited him as, a, as an expert on chemistry and explosives to work on, you know, US explosives de design. And he you know, made a lot of uh, important steps forward. So in 1943, he was recruited to the Manhattan Project to work on the implosion system. So this had been proceeding under a guy called Seth Nadermeyer, and initially it was a low priority. Uh, it, there was no need, they didn't think they would need it because they knew that a gun type device was the simplest way to assemble a critical mass. And the reason they had the implosion work was because they sort of understood that in theory they could get a more efficient weapon, but they probably wouldn't need that until after the war. The, you know, back in these early tests, they hadn't figured out explosive lenses. They would assemble uh, various pieces of explosives into a sphere with a lot of detonators, and then this, they would put in like a padding or baffling in between the blocks, and these would, you know, support, they were, were supposed to damp the shock waves that would happen when two explosions like intersected. The problem, of course, with implosion is that you want to take a diverging spherical explosion and twist it into an Im <laughs> a convergent set of waves to crush your uh, core. So anyway, uh, Kistakowski comes in and he brings a lot of new ideas like using x-rays to examine the blocks of explosives and using explosive lenses to shape the detonation waves. And he would ultimately replace Seth Niedermeyer in uh, February of 1944. So in mid-1944, it was then discovered that the plutonium that was being supplied from the reactors had way too much plutonium-240 in it. And that meant that the plutonium was generating too many spontaneous fissions. So the thing, when you form a critical mass, it doesn't actually start exploding automatically. It actually takes some neutrons to start the explosion. So normally this actually comes from either a neutron generator or it can come from spontaneous fission. Spontaneous fission is something you can't actually control. Now, if you are trying to assemble a plutonium uh, critical mass by firing one block into another, as the blocks get closer and closer, they pass through what's you know a critical mass threshold. And then it's just waiting for the first neutron to happen. And so the problem with the plutonium they were getting was that it was just spitting out neutrons all the time. So it would get partially assembled and then it would explode. And so it wouldn't generate anywhere near the kind of yield they wanted. And so with this, they realized the only way to make this work was to assemble the critical mass faster. And implosion was much, much faster than assembly via a gun type device. So the Manhattan Project set up a new top-level group, X Division, that was created under George Kistakowski to solve this very problem. So for the implosion system, they would use 5,300 pounds, that's about two and a half tons of high explosives, and they would use two types of high explosive. One would be Composition B, which is a mixture of TNT and RDX, and Another one would be baritol, a mixture of TNT and barium nitrate. The reason why you have two different explosives is they explode at different rates. When you start a detonation, you have a detonation wave that moves through the material as the shock front actually triggers the chemical reaction. In composition B, the wave front would move at nine kilometers per second, and in baritol, it would move at about five kilometers per second. And because of the difference in speed, you could have curved boundaries between the regions and you could focus the shock waves. You could take the divergent wave and turn it into a convergent wave, perfect for that implosion. So that was the explosive lens system. And this required making a sphere out of blocks of explosives. They used a soccer ball type of design. So they had 20 hexagonal segments and 12 pentagonal segments and when you assembled these all together it created something that looked like a football a soccer ball 
except that it was much, much larger. So you needed 32 of these pieces per bomb. They spent a lot of time solving the problems, making sure they worked, but the problem they had was quality control. They needed perfect pieces because if there was any imperfection in these pieces, if there was, say, an air bubble, as the shockwave hits it, it slows down, it changes, the wave front um, you know, starts to pick up imperfections and any imperfection becomes amplified in an implosion. Kelvin Helmholtz instability is what we call it and that's where you've got explosions that are, or implosions that are converging. It just wants to find places where it can squirt out sideways rather than being squished down. So, um, yeah, so Kistakowski, he was very much a hands-on leader. He looked at all the, the hardware, he was looking at all the pieces. They actually needed, they didn't just need 32 pieces for the Trinity test, they actually needed uh, 64 because there was actually going to be another test of the implosion system before the Trinity test. And they used some of the x-ray techniques to like look at the blocks, they would make sure there was no edges, they would make sure there was no bubbles inside, but even then they were not getting the yield that they needed. And so, you know, before the bomb, while the bomb was being assembled, uh, George decided to take things into his own hands. He was very much a hands-on leader, as I said, and he got himself a dentist drill. And he began taking blocks which were not quite perfect, that had air bubbles just a little bit inside them, and he started drilling into blocks of high explosives, just sitting there with them in his lap. And he said he didn't worry about this too much because if something did happen, he wouldn't register it, right? It would be over too quickly for him. Yeah, somebody else would have to deal with it, but whatever. Yeah, he would drill down into these holes, remove enough material so he could access it, and then he would melt new explosives because the TNT could be melted uh, with the RDX and they would pour that in, let it set, polish it off, cover it up again, and they would have a, a val an ideal piece. And so with that, they were able to get the parts together for the test and for the Trinity test. So the, the pre-test was going to be run by a guy called Kreutz, and that was going to happen at uh, Los Alamos. So yeah, they built the device largely at Los Alamos. The you know explosive material around the outside, the tamper... Uh, a lot of the uranium, they left out the pit and they left out one segment of the explosive. explosive. The pit was trans, uh, you know, was taken in one convoy, the bomb with all the explosives was taken in another convoy. So at the core, what you have is this, you know, small spherical pit with the plutonium in it. Inside that is the neutron initiator, a thing which is made of beryllium and polonium that when crushed brings them into contact so that they generate neutrons. And this is going to guarantee that you get a burst of neutrons at exactly the right moment. Inside of it, they put this inside a cylinder, or a plug of uranium, and that then gets lowered into the middle of the bomb. And then, as they're doing this, they run into a minor problem. The very expensive cylinder of fissile material isn't fitting. It just goes in and it won't fit into the hole there. <laughs> and they get very concerned because really they want to get this test over with. What they realized was that the, the bomb had been, sit, the, you know, this explosives assembly had been sitting, kept in the shade and was not as warm as the, the core. Because of course the core, the pit, is radioactive and it generates its own heat. It was warmer and therefore it had expanded. And so they allowed, you know, time for the temperatures of the two materials to equalize and eventually it slid in there. So now with the bomb ready to go, it was just a question of uh, making sure that the tests and everything run. And that's when they kind of ran into a problem. See, that uh, test back at Los Alamos car carried out by Kreutz, uh, it showed that the detonators weren't fine with, with sufficient accuracy to guarantee a perfect implosion. And suddenly there was a lot of concern that the Trinity device would not, in fact, work as uh, advertised. Um, in fact, it got so bad that apparently uh, in a conversation between Kitzkowski and Oppenheimer, he, uh, he says, I, Oppie, I guarantee this will work. I'll bet my entire month's salary against $10 that the Trinity is going to work. 
you, they see there is this fundamental problem that when you're trying to make this implosion, you have to make the explosives happen with near simultaneity. As I said, the uh, composition B, the blast front, the shock front in that moves at about nine kilometers per second. That means every microsecond it's moving nine millimeters. So if there's one microsecond in difference, then you've almost got one centimeter in difference between one side of the bomb and the other. And that can start to provide an avenue for non-perfect implosion. They needed nanosecond or tens of nanoseconds, hundreds of nanoseconds precision on the detonation of these devices. To trigger all these things, what you have is a single triggering system that will send a high voltage to them. And this high voltage and high ampage, the high powerful current will flow across a pair of tiny wires and these wires will heat up and then explode. They're called exploding bridge wire detonators. And by using very fine wires and very high voltages and high currents, these explode very, very quickly and with great timing precision. The problem is you need a circuit that can go from nothing to thousands of volts in nanoseconds. And you can't just have a switch, right? You can't literally throw a physical switch because uh, if you've got that kind of voltage on both sides, as you bring them together, you're going to get arcing and the voltage will rise not as quickly. It'll, it'll rise more slowly. And if it rises slowly, then the bridge wires are going to explode at slightly different times and your simultaneity is going to be ruined. So they needed a mechanism for turning this on very quickly. And it turns out another individual who was associated with the Trinity test had sort of been involved in the solution since uh, for a few years. So you might have seen some of the famous footage of the Trinity test, some of the great photos taken by a guy called Harold Edgerton. Now he was an innovator in photography. He had invented the electronic flash and for example the some had come up with the ways to freeze some very cool events. You know, his, one of his, my favorite photos of history is the, the coronet formed by a splash of a drop of milk falling into this. And this was done by a well-timed electronic flash. Now, of course, war comes around, the government are looking for people that can help them. And he helps out making a surveillance aircraft, which has a giant camera flash. So this is an aircraft that could fly over a target at night and then fire this huge, powerful xenon flash with a camera, snap a photo, and then continue on. And of course, anyone on the ground is dazzled and doesn't know what they're seeing. It turns out the problem of firing a flash is very similar to the problem of firing a detonators. So by the time the Manhattan Project is looking for how to build its firing set, Raytheon is building these flash mechanisms using large numbers of capacitors and you know triggering tubes. These are spark gap triggering tubes. And uh, you know the Manhattan Project gets very interested in this hardware. So the way that these work is that you have like a, a tube, right? A glass tube with a, an inert gas inside and then you have a pair of rounded electrodes and these carry very high, the high voltage that you wanna bridge. Now, because you've got a very smooth round surface, it doesn't automatically ionize the air, right? They're far enough apart, the curvature is low enough that the electric fields aren't strong enough to cause the field to break down. Then you have a pair of very fine wires coming from another direction and these ones are very sharp. So it only takes a small voltage on these to cause the electric, you know, to cause the gas to break down and form an electric arc. And once that happens, that electric arc creates an ionized path in the gas, which jumps between the two big electrodes. And then suddenly you have all that voltage, all that current flowing very, very quickly. So this is called a spark gap initiator um, and or a trigger tube. And that's what they had been using. Now there's a modern version of the, sorry, after the war, Edgerton's company, uh, EG&G, would make a variation on this called the Crytron, right? Which you may have heard about. It's a MacGuffin used in movies frequently when we're talking about nuclear secrets. And of course, there are other versions like Sprytrons, which are more robust against uh, radiation, for example. So anyway, this hardware is what would be used in the firing set that would trigger uh, trigger the, the, the gadget and ultimately Fat Man. So anyway, 
Coming back to the Trinity test, a few days beforehand, Hans Bethe looked at the experiment that had been carried out by the Kreutz group up at uh, the Los Al Alamos and had realized that, well, no matter if the, if the test had actually been perfect, even then the experiment that had measured the simultaneity would not have been able to show the difference. Therefore, there was no reason to suspect that the explosion wasn't going to actually operate within the kind of precision needed. And so, yes, Trinity did actually go off and it did go off with a great success. Kostkowski was outside uh, the, you know, the shock house. He was standing on a mound of dirt and he got knocked over by the blast. He proceeded inside, found Oppenheimer and said, give me my $10. And unfortunately, apparently Oppenheimer didn't have the money in his wallet. I think he was a little gazed, uh, you know, quoting uh, Sanskrit or something at the time. The Trinity test would actually be the most powerful nuclear explosion for some time to come. Modern estimates put its yield at about 25 kilotons, far above that of the little boy and uh, more than the fat man or the weapons used in the crossroads tests. And I like to think that some of that yield comes down to the love and care that the engineers put into its assembly, including, yeah, that guy with a dentist drill drilling into blocks of explosives. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.